So again, if there's if there are variable, variables needed in your integrals limits, it can only appear in these inner two. By the time you get to that outer order of integration, the outer limits are always going to have to have constant limits. They have to. Okay. So let's just try one of the other orders. All right. One of the on the next page, I suggest setting up the interval. Oh, by the way, sorry about this. <coughs> Let me read the instructions. It says set up the triple integral for a generic function f of x, y, z. So in other words, up here we were given the function that was 8, y, z, but this one says just a generic function f of x, y, z. So that's intended to be our integrand. So I guess just to be a completist about it, we don't know what this function is. It's just some generic function that we would integrate over this tetrahedron to find whatever its, its integral value would be. And I guess to give you some kind of context as to what the heck a triple integral can measure, because I don't want to just use hyper volume as an example, but let's say this function here measures, I don't know, and I'm, I'm taking a stab because, again, I'm kind of deficit on physics. Once you go past Newtonian mechanics, it's all dirt to me, okay? Um, but say, let's say this represents something like coulombs per cubic meter. There you go. Maybe. All right, and then if you and if you have a varying you know coulomb per cubic meter concentration in this kind of magnet, whatever kind of field of coulomb would be in, you know coulombs per cubic meter. If x, y, and z represent increments in meters, then this would measure the net change in coulombs per cubic meter times meters times meters times meters. So what would your overall output? Coulombs per cube. Well, this, this is coulombs per, per meter cube. So it's the coulombs. And then if your integration limits, or if, the, if these differentials represent z meters, um, x meters, and y meters. So your dimensional analysis is coulombs per meter cube times meter, times meter, times meter. So times cubic meters. Coulombs. 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 Yeah. This would measure the net change in coulombs over some kind of, well, whatever that region in space, in that tetrahedron. That's so then maybe that is flux. If cool, coulombs is with electricity, right? Yeah. So maybe there's some sort of net electrical charge density for you know particles yeah. interacting with this tetrahedron in space. I'm trying to remember. Okay. Again, I I just know that how to set the limits up. The integration is fun to me. It's just that I've never seen the physics end of it. Yeah. I kind of need to see the physics end of it, so I don't have to you know, be such a lame cow free teacher all the time. I think class is part of it. Yeah, well, I've taken the best. I've, I've, the only thing I've done is I sat through Ken Swain's 1510-1520 back in like 2006, but that was on Newtonian mechanics. I'm like, I know this stuff. It's the, it's the magnetism. You get free tuition here, right? Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. I can take free classes here. So <laughs> I just you know need to get off my lazy butt and take one of these classes. <laughs> With Farvin, what about um, um, you say Farvin's a good one? Yeah. Yeah, I've, yeah I've, he I've, teaches. I've, too. I mean, I I be careful. This is on video. So, <laughs> say good things if you want to say anything at all. If there's I'll anything bad you want to say, let me know after class. Um, I'm not, I'm not as familiar with Farm, but I know um, Saeed Vejnu. I've, I've yeah, you know, I know everyone else. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, if we switch orders, um, let's, which of these two do you want to do? All right. You want to do the X, Y, Z order or the Y, Z, X order? Y, Z, X. You want to do Y, Z, X. Okay. So, and I'll, I'll go ahead and do this third one too before I scan it in just to give you some experience. But I, I just wanted to, you know, just to kind of save some time, just to show you one other order of integration just to set it up. Um, so if we commit to doing the Y order, then the Z order, then the X order, start with a fresh copy of your tetrahedron, okay? And we're doing Y, then Z, then X. So first things first, increasing Y direction in three space the increasing y direction represents your entrance and your exit in that direction. So you want to make sure you're going in the increasing y axis direction. So if I want to go in the y direction first, I want to imagine piercing through this thing, coming through like this. So then I would enter back here on the x, z plane. And then I would be inside the tetrahedron for a little bit. And then I would exit coming out that way. Because again, that's the positive y direction. <coughs> okay. So based on this skewed image, this is intended to be flat against the XZ plane back here. So when you enter at this entrance, are you always going to have the same entrance if I draw that blue ray anywhere? Yeah, yeah no matter where I go, I'm going to enter at the XZ plane. The XZ plane is special because what does that represent for Y? y if you're on the XZ plane, <laughs> Y equals zero. So you're entering this solid at the Y equals zero boundary. You are exiting on the plane surface, but again, 
it's all jumbled up and implicit right here. So you need to redefine this so that you represent y's equation. So if, if the plane here, this tilted plane for the surface represents where I exit, I've got 2y equals 2 minus x minus z. So y technically equals 1 half of all that if I solve for y correctly. So the exit boundary, no matter where I draw that blue directional, you're always going to enter on the back base, that lateral face. You're always going to exit on the slanted face, which is defined by that plane. So your exit will always be y equals that business. And so that should be your upper limit for the y order of integration. Do you see the consistency? I mean, in most cases, I usually try to go for the z direction first. I'm just trying to show you the versatility here. If you maybe for some reason doing the y direction is more convenient for the integration, you know, maybe it'll make you not have to do integration by parts or something like that, or even worse, a trig stuff, heaven forbid, you know. But then the y limits are done. Where do we project it to now? The z x plane. So set y to zero in this equation, and now I want to kind of project this backwards. So again, it's kind of a screwy frame of reference because notice this is positive x and positive x is to your left and positive z is up above. So if I flatten this to where it looks like a regular two-dimensional xz plane, don't let it break your heart. If I want that to be positive x and this to be positive z, you know, it technically means you have to invert the image a little bit. You still have the same x and z intercepts, positive and negative two right there, but notice it sort of switches it around. Okay? And then the equation, again, the easiest thing to do for the equation of that line is just to take the equation for your surface here and mill out or void out the value that we just did for the first order of integration. Y was done, Y goes to zero, this is projected the XZ plane, so this becomes the equation X plus Z equals two. And we are committing to doing the Z direction next. So if I go in the increasing z direction, y'all okay? Because mm -hmm. I'm breezing through this. Mm -hmm. All right. So positive z-axis, positive x-axis, doing the z direction first. So this technically represents what used to be a, like a cross-section of the base of the solid. This is sort of a lateral cross-section of the top of the solid. Um, now we're going through the base at z equals 0, and we're exiting at z equals 2 minus x. The equation of the line dictates the top boundary for your z limits. And then this gets flattened to the one direction you have left to do. The dimension that's left is the x-axis. So if this is flattened to the x-axis, all that's left is the interval from 0 to 2. So as a triple integral for a generic function f of xy, z, it would look something like this. finally set it up. <coughs> okay? Not too bad. Now, all the volume problems that we've done so far have just been with, with double integrals. As a matter of fact, you know, one of the things you could be asked to do in your test is to use a double integral to find the volume of the solid. The way we did it with double integrals, a good, you know, subtle test review here, is when you're doing um, double integrals to get volume, you set it up as the double integral of whatever is on the top <laughs> over the underlying region. So in other words, whatever defines the top of your solid, most often it's going to be a z equals equation that defines the top of your surface. Um, we would set this up as z equals, well, z equals 2 minus x minus 2y is on top. So I would be integrating 2 minus x minus 2y. And then we commit to, to either order of integration. Well, we've already done the x and the y limits back here. 
if this is projected down to the xy plane, you can say that your, your x integration goes from 0 to 2 minus y. Your x, so that's x, your dy limits go from 0 to 1, right? So that's how this would be calculated as a, as a double integral volume problem. The double integral over the underlying region that's the base of the solid, and you do the double integral with whatever function is on the top. The top of the solid is defined by that, that slanted plane. So you do the double integral for the plane, it projects all these vertical lines downward, these vertical planes downward to the xy plane down here at the base, because that's the domain you're defining for the double integral. If you want to calculate a volume using a triple integral, it actually kind of, after one step of integration, it turns into this double interval I've got on the board to your left. Um, what you actually do is if you do the triple interval of the function 1, what it does is it calculates the volume of the solid that you're looking at, the, the solid region in space. Um, similarly, what happens if you do a double integral for the function 1? It's the area. It's the area of the underlying region here. Because, I mean, go one step back to calculus too. What's the, what's the integral of function 1 from 0 to 5? Your differential here represents an increment on the x-axis, essentially just a section of the x-axis. So if I integrate 1 from 0 to 5, it's 5. It technically represents the length of an interval. One dimension higher than one dimensional intervals, intervals is two dimensional area. So when you do a double integral of 1, you're finding the base area of your underlying region. Single integral of 1, the length of the x-axis that underlies it. Double integral of 1, the area of the two-dimensional region that underlies. So when you do a triple integral of the function 1, the underlying region here is a 3D region in space. So when you integrate, when you triple integrate the function 1, it's actually calculating the volume of whatever your solid is. Okay? So, if we wanted to calculate the volume of this, turn that right there into the number one. And then choose any one of the orders of integration. Um, which of, of the two that we did figure out, which one do you want to commit to? The first one or the, this next one? The first one, because it is never practical, right? <laughs> exactly. I'm the, I'm the same way. I'm like, eh. It's got more zeros in it. Well, this one all has, has all zeros at the bottom, too. But you know, this one has no fractions in it. So if we set up a, a triple integral that would calculate this volume, I'll just go ahead and commit to this one. All we do is just turn the function here, the generic f of x, y, z, into a 1. So that way, the volume would equal this triple integral's value. Now, anybody know how to find the volume of a tetrahedron? So we can double check this at the end? What's a tetrahedron? <laughs> Pardon? <laughs> I don't mean to be so blatantly honest there. Oh, well, yeah, a tetrahedron, the, um, the, the shape right here. That's a tetrahedron? Yeah. It's, it's, got, it's got four triangles, triangles as its faces. Okay. Yeah. Come up to period. I believe the volume is the base area times one third of the height. Base area times one third. And the base area here is a triangle that's one by two. Oh, yeah, it's a right triangle that's one by two in the xy plane. That triangle would have one half, one times two, would have a base of one square unit. The height is two, because I think the z-intercept is two, isn't it? So yeah, the base area here is one. The height is two, so base times height would give me two cubic units. You take one third of the base times the height for a tetrahedron, so it should be two thirds should be the, the total volume. So hopefully, that's what this should evaluate as. Let's keep our fingers crossed, or maybe I just remember the, the, the volume function incorrectly. Now I've got, it says V equals A cubed over six to the squared book. to two. Over six squared to two? That must be a very specific tetrahedron. Regular tetrahedron. Oh, okay, so like a hydronium ion or something like that. Yeah, no, this one's not regular. Okay. You've got different size faces or something like that, so no, it's it's, it's very irregular. Okay, cool. So I think that one's taking advantage of the yeah the specific <coughs> symmetric geometry, just knowing like one of the edge lengths. Okay. We don't know the edge lengths. I'm just using base area times uh, one third the height. Cool. So that should be it. it. Should be should be two thirds. So if I do z's order first, the antiderivative of one with respect to z is the easiest integration when you do volume or area problems. You're integrating one, so. Ah, but oh, hey, hey, hey. What if you wanted the area of a polar region? What would your double integral be? Hmm. Wait, what? 
if you're doing the area of a polar region, you know, and over here on the board I say that area in, with double integrals is the double integral of the function 1. But if you wanted to find the area for a polar region, what would you double integrate? I mean, you probably have 2 pi and r values in your limits on the oh. integral, but what would be your integrand? Just r. R. Why? Because um, <laughs> that's what I told you. <laughs> <laughs> because I told you, every time you convert to polar for any hertz, you have that extra r in your integral. So yeah, it would be the function 1 for dx, dy limits. If you convert that to polar for something circular involving your underlying region, you always have to default to that extra r with your dr, d theta. So technically you're not integrating 1, you integrate r because it's always there when you convert to polar. Tiny little technicality, but, but that's technically what you have to do. So then plugging my z limits, and I'm trying my best not to make my 2's look like z's. <coughs> Bless you. Excuse me, thank you. So 2 minus x minus 2y minus 0 would technically be what I get when I plug in my z limits. I think I did that right. And then I want to integrate this with respect to x next. So I didn't really give myself too much room. So if I integrate this with respect to x, the, the other two terms are constant. So keep in mind, that's going to be a 2x <laughs> bless you, minus half x squared uh, minus 2xy. And oh, yay at the algebra that this is going to lead to. Huh. All right. So then I get some marginal scrap paper. And let me hash that out because I definitely didn't commit enough room to it here. When I plug these limits in, keep in mind, these plug in for the x's. Thank goodness the bottom limit is 0, so it's going to annihilate everything. So I get 2 times 2 minus 2y minus 1 half 2 minus 2y squared um, minus 2x times, no, dumb, 2y times 2 minus 2y, because you're plugging these in for the x's. And the bottom limit is going to wipe everything out. So yeah, watch out for that. That's a mistake I make every once in a while. I forget which variable I'm plugging stuff in for. So I'm plugging all these in for x's. So that should be 2y um, times 2 minus 2y there. Sorry about the time. Okay, awesome. So then just you know, be careful. I mean, I, I would probably just, just take care of the algebra real quick. 4 minus 4y minus, you know, we could integrate that with the u sub, but that's, that's kind of trifling. So if I foil that out, 4 minus 8y plus 4y squared, at least all the coefficients are equal. And then minus 4y plus 4y squared, business, business, business. So then my, my collection of like terms step. You'd have 8y, negative 8y. I have negative 8y, why? Where? Because you have minus 4y and minus 4y. Oh, I'm not doing that yet. I'm yeah. just I'm just shooting this uh, negative one half okay. of the next. Okay, so I see what you're doing. Plus four y minus two y squared minus four y plus four y squared. So now like terms. These are like terms. I've got a two y squared um, like term like term and they cancel. Thank you much. Minus four y. So all the y terms are coded together, and the constants hash out to a plus two. So by the time I plug in those limits for the x, I'm, again, this is the end of the x half of the integration, of the, of the x third of the integration. Um, I get that for what I want to integrate with respect to y. So just like in your solutions manual, some work goes here, and then magically this becomes 2y squared minus 4y plus 2. And that's usually the steps that are omitted from solution manuals because they're like, oh, that's algebra, they can do that. Yeah. Because you know, you look at the solution main thing, that comes in that line. Because all these steps were, were omitted most likely. So now my last order of integration, and thank goodness the limits are zero to one. Integrating this with respect to y is gonna give me um, two thirds y cubed <coughs> minus two y squared plus two y. And again, when you're dealing with polynomials, the handy thing about a one limit is you get the coefficients. And obviously the handy thing about the zero limit is it annihilates everything. So when I get these coefficients back by plugging in ones for all the y's. Yep, two thirds. 
So if you ever need the volume of a tetrahedron, I would probably just commit the formula to memory. One third base area times height. Yeah. A regular tetrahedron probably has, um, yeah. I guess, equilateral triangles for all the bases or something like that. So there's another stylized version for it. Okay, so it's good, you know, to get consistency in the math. A geometric formula that validates the calculus that we did. So I'll double check what these limits are before I scan it in. So if you want to test yourself to set up the x, y, z order, I'll answer this before I scan it in so you can kind of compare your answer to mine and see if you're, yeah, you get it right. Okay. And this, my friends, is the reason I had to switch the positions of polar and, and triple integrals because of the setup of this particular integral right here. Okay. Now, this is another one where it's, it's, it's careful to pay attention to the prepositions. I'm, I'm going to draw the solid that we're actually going to be using in this region. Okay, it's a volume problem. So since it is a volume problem, I'm doing the triple integral of the function 1. And again, remember what the d, d, x, d, a, d, b differentials represent? In double integrals, the, the generic differential is d, a, because why? Because your base region is a two-dimensional area. In 3D, when you have a triple integral, the generic representation of dx, dy, dz is condensed as db because your underlying region is a three-dimensional volume or a solid. So, you know, volume is calculated by doing the triple integral for the function one. All we need to do is translate whatever the description of the solid is into some x, y, z limits. So, calculate the volume of the region inside, inside, very important preposition here. You're going to know your prepositions like crazy before you leave this class. <laughs> and prepositions are just locatives. You need as many verbal descriptions to, to help you locate your positioning and, and your framework in space. So the region is inside a cylinder. Now, that looks like the circle of radius 2 in the x, y plane. But keep in mind, we're extending this to three dimensions. Z equals zero. So if it's, if it's independent of z, if z were equal zero, we'd be in the x, y plane circle of radius 2. This equation is independent of z. So that means any trace at z equals 0, I see a circle of radius 2. At z equals 1, I still see that same circle of radius 2. At z equals 10, I still see that circle of radius 2. So that's why that is a proper cylinder in space. Mm -hmm. This equation is independent of z, so no matter what your z value is, it's inside of a circular cylinder. Your, your regular idea of a cylinder, you know, paper towel tube, lightsaber from gift wrap, you know, cylinder of radius 2, okay? So that's just an infinite cylinder. It's just an infinite yeah. cylinder. Just that first description is an infinite cylinder sheathed around the, the z-axis, wrapped around the z-axis, okay? Now we got some other descriptions here too. Um, it is inside the cylinder lying beneath the plane 2y plus z equals 12. So, you know, we can graph that if we have to, but, you know, give me a rough representation of <coughs> Here's our cylinder. What's this plane doing to our, our region? Cutting it. It's cutting it at the top somewhere because the region lies beneath it. Guess what part of speech that is? Preposition. Okay. <laughs> so you're inside the cylinder. You're beneath this plane. And third preposition, above, you're above the XY plane. So paying very careful attention to those prepositions in the description of the region really kind of gives you an idea. You've got this infinite cylinder of radius 2 wrapped around the z-axis cut on the top because our region is beneath this plane up here. So it sort of cuts it at a slant possibly because how do I know that's not a plane that's flat? From the y, z. Because you have y and z in the mix. If it were just z equals 12, Z equals 12 would be yeah. parallel to Z equals 0, the XY plane, but it has 2Y plus Z equals 12, so it's a tilted plane. It's got a proper tilt to it. Um, so cylinder, stuff inside it, beneath this plane. So, so far it's an infinite tube of lipstick that has a slant on the top of it, for those of you who've used lipstick before. Um, <laughs> I've seen it, never used it. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> I think the best, you know, but anyway. Um, <laughs> above the XY plane. So what's beneath this? So it's above the xy plane, inside the cylinder, beneath this plane on top. What does it look like? Like a cut-off cylinder. Like a, like a cut-off cylinder, yeah. A, a cylinder with a slanted cut-off on the top. Okay? So it looks something roughly like this. A cylinder of radius 2. Okay? So here's our, and I'll just do a generic cross-section here representing the fact that it's supposed to be circular. Cut off below at the xy plane. And on the top, 
you have this tilted plane cutting into it. So this is possibly some representation of what this solid looks like. Okay. And we want to use this to help us set up our, our limits of integration. We want to find the volume of this solid. Um, well, what's the volume of a cylinder? Area times height. Base area times Base height. Area for, and that's the cool because so for any cylinder, five, base area is a circle of radius 2. So that's 4 pi for the base area. Now be careful, the height indicates that the top is parallel to the bottom. No such love there. Okay, But you could probably use the average height right here because of the tilt of it. Okay? Um, what would that the height of that center value be? Well, it would use this Planck's equation zero. from the center being at the origin, and it would use y equals 0. So if y were equal 0 in that equation, what would the height be? 12. 12. So base area, circle of radius 2, pi r squared, 4 pi, times an average height of 12. And average is okay here because of the, the top is a linear slant. So 4 pi times 12, 48 pi should be the volume of the solid. Okay? Because you can always take that average height, cut this part off, hinge it over, and then flatten it out so that that, that void is filled with that extra bit. So it could turn into a regular you know, paper towel roll cylinder and make it look flat on the top. So but let's do triple integrals to double check and see. What limit would you want to do first? Z. Yeah, do the z direction first. So if I go in the z direction, um, and this is what my solid looks like, I go to the bottom, you're going to enter at the, the base, you're going to be inside it all the way until you hit the, the little tilted plane on the top. Now, since this cylinder is wrapped around the z-axis, is that blue ray always going to have the same entrance and exit? Mm -hmm. That blue ray is in the positive z direction, so that means positive z is due vertical. These sides right here are parallel to the z-axis. If that ray is parallel to z's direction, no matter where I draw it, I'm always going to enter at the circle at the base on the xy plane. I'm always going to exit at the tilted plane on top. So, because you'll be parallel to the sides, the lateral part of the cylinder while you're inside of it. So, z's limits can consistently be listed as entering at z equals what? Zero. Yeah. Zero, because you're above the xy plane. Very important preposition there. But you're beneath this plane. So therefore, z stops where? 12 12 minus two at 12 minus 2y. You have to take the equation, solve it for z, because you're defining z's limit. So that represents your z limits. Then, I guess now that you're projected down to the xy plane, when this is flattened to the xy plane, what kind of base region do you get? Oops, I just drew it for you. Polar. Yeah. You're, since you're inside this cylinder of radius 2, that cylinder of radius 2 in 3D, when, when flattened down here, becomes a circle of radius 2 at the base. So that's why I recommend doing polar when you get to doing the xy limits. So does that make sense? We've already committed to the z limits of integration, and it's, it's correct. I do want to go from zero to the planes equation. So if we at least do the z order of integration, and then that converts a triple integral to a double integral, then you just make it a polar integral for the remaining part of the volume calculation. So volume would equal the triple integral. And again, I'm saving this for later. Saving those limits for x, y plane. The z limits are from zero to 12 minus 2y. My integrand, originally, is just the number one, because this was described as a volume problem. Right? Was there a question? All right. So then if I integrate z first, that's just going to be z. And the only thing to plug in there is, is 12 minus 2y. So yeah, we kind of turn it into a volume problem for double integrals. Because now look what happens when you're at the, the double integral stage.
Well, I, I, I guess I'll stick with what I've got listed here. Looks like I'm starting to write Sanskrit on the board. Sorry about that. But we're doing DX, DY last. The reason I've got this here is because what's left is not a bullseye. We're not going to shoot some deer. This represents the circle of radius 2 that we're going to integrate over, which is best done by converting to polar. Okay? But notice what the, the double integral calculation would have been for volume. What is defining the top of this shape? The plane. The plane z equals 12 minus 2y. So if we set this up as a volume calculation for a double integral, we would have been integrating 12 minus 2y. z equals 12 minus 2y since it's on the top over what underlying region at its base? A circle of radius 2, because all this stuff is trapped inside that cylinder of radius 2 above the xy plane. So volume problems are kind of versatile. You can do them as double integrals if that's easier for you to see, or you can do them as triple integrals. You know, Most probably probably choose double just because that's one less step of integration you do. But yeah, now you're back at a double interval volume problem that stemmed from this triple interval volume problem. Um, and we're committing to converting to polar. So since our underlying region now is a circle of radius 2, r is going to go from 0 to 2 for this underlying region. Theta goes from 0 to 2 pi. So full circle of radius 2 commits to those r and theta limits. So converting this to polar, Your integrand, 12 minus 2y becomes 12 minus 2 r sine theta. 12 minus 2 r sine theta because x's get replaced with r cosine theta, standalone y's get replaced with r sine theta. 12 minus 2 r sine theta. Then don't forget, there's the extra r because you're converting to polar. So don't forget the extra r. That would distribute to your integrand to really give you this. So you're really ultimately going to integrate 12r minus 2r squared sine theta. Okay. So there's what you need to remember there, is to replace y with r sine theta when doing the conversion, and then the extra r distributes through. So when I integrate this with respect to r, that gives me 6r squared minus 2 thirds r to the third. Sine theta is a constant, nothing, nothing involving theta just yet. So when you replace your 2, <coughs> you're going to get 24 less, well, 16 thirds sine theta and then minus goose egg. And then when you integrate, are y'all okay? Then when you integrate theta, Um, you've actually got a function of theta this time. Well, I'm to look at there. So it's usually, you know, just a constant by the time you get to the theta part of the interval. 24 theta minus uh, y plus 16 thirds cosine theta. I forgot my sine antiderivative there for a second. Um, cosine's value is exactly the same as 0 and 2 pi, so this part technically cancels out in the subtraction. So really, you're just going to have a 24 times 2 pi you should end up with a 48 pi. And I've already forgotten what we did about 10 minutes ago for the area through the volume the old way. Base area is pi r squared, so 4 pi average height is 12. 12 times 4, most often 48. So yeah, it's consistent. <coughs> That's always a good feeling for me. I don't know. I get more of a charge out of that than some people will do. Whenever you're, you know, you're checking something with geometry versus calculus and the calculus matches up with it. It's, like, yeah, so, it's all legal.